<laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? TJ what is this? On his own. I know there's a lot of OP characters, but is it really possible to beat the entire game with just one guy? Who would win? Every known being in the universe or a gun? Total War is a massive game with over 275 <laughs> factions. And today we'll yes. be fighting them. All of them. But oh my, what? <laughs> Wait, no, I need to go back and see that. Dude, look at that. You're at war with so many factions that it goes off of the grid. <laughs> That's insane. The game was not meant to be played this way, but oh well. Fighting them. All of them. By declaring war on every single nation from turn one. And what better way to do it than with the strongest turn magical one. spell ever invented. Gun. As a fleet of undead pirates, the Vampire Coast boasts nothing but powder, cannons, and the doctrine of manifest destiny. All led by Count Noctilus von Washington, founding father and author of the Second Amendment. Now, Count Noctilus is a very special lord, because he is the only character to start in the middle of nowhere. Our capital, the Galleon's graveyard oh. is completely isolated in the um i forget which was it reggie's video this was the donut right <laughs> just a random donut in the middle of nowhere or maybe that was no 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 that was where the high elves live this is just near that ocean so for right now we're safe but make no mistake the ai can and will send armies here so that won't last very long to declare war on every single faction i'm using an advanced technique called doing it manually using a console command mod i can reveal all factions for diplomacy now this doesn't give us okay. any practical advantage it just means i can talk with any faction so i'm able to declare war on them i also turned on end game Roger crises that. including the newly added vermintide so while i'm starting world war 3 some ground rules for the campaign rule number one i must be at war War with every faction and must immediately That's declare insane. war if I meet a new one. Throughout the game, Can't new world armies, horde factions, and rebellions this. will end up spawning that I don't have vision of. But as soon as I see them, rule number two, I cannot make peace unless I declare war immediately after. Meaning our peace treaties are just scams to extort money. And lastly, rule number three, wait, War Thunder? Wait, I didn't write What? That. The sponsor of this video, <laughs> War Thunder. We're committing military uh, atrocities. I... Has never been more fun. Last I heard of War Thunder, there was some anime, controversy with the devs and the community. And ships on PC, Xbox, Hopefully that's PS5, been sorted out by now. But the honor of your great leader with Chinese tanks or the bellowing might of the Italian Navy. With every vehicle modeled down to each component, you'll know what it ocean? means to truly War Thunder. As the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, it's historically accurate down to even the smallest Japanese decal. Oh. And if you're less hardcore oh like me, don't worry, there's options. The only thing this game is missing is civilians. So play War Thunder this <laughs> nanosecond using the link in the description uh, or pinned comment below to get free stuff. And if you don't, just remember, I'm watching. Uh, uh, um. With all of that said, let's get back to things. Because I would like to formally welcome you to hell. The fruitful result of me spending over an hour just declaring wars. An you know hour? things are serious when you have five save games and it's still turn one. After declaring war on the <laughs> final faction, our wars list was this. And just like that, I've destroyed pretty much all hope of world peace or the UI working as intended. Which leaves just yeah. one thing left to do. Fight 275 factions. Well kill me why are we doing this to ourselves zombies are pretty awful give For a zombie content. a gun and they'll probably miss but give 100 zombies a gun and now somebody's gonna hit you probably miss. the vampire coast mostly consists of deceased rednecks with floating trailers but count noctilus starts with a special unit the necrofex colossus these walking Ooh. boats are yeah i saw these in the cinematic trailer they look really badass and i mean i guess the fact that you get to start with one of these is a uh, a big help but this isn't exactly a one-man army however i suppose once we get to that point we might like take off all of our units and go ham i mean reggie was able to do that but that was with a, a modded leader they're icons of american ingenuity and are the hard carry of our army but to get more we need money unfortunately being at war with everyone holding on to more than just one settlement isn't possible at least for now luckily most factions are too busy doing their own thing to fight us at the beginning so our first turns need to be spent preparing for the inevitable 16 armies showing yeah. up at my door faster than a jehovah's they're gonna witness come. the vampire coast also also has Eventually. a horde mechanic that works with Noctilus, allowing him to build and upgrade his ship, functioning like a mobile settlement. At max level, the ship gets powerful bonuses, but it costs multiple black market kidneys to get there. Although, <laughs> as respectable gentlemen, we have a few options to make that money. We could sail to the islands and wrecks around the ocean for treasure, or just steal it. Is the treasure, like, a specific thing 
for this faction, the zombie pirates. I feel like there was a video that mentioned you could collect treasure and stuff using heroes from your faction. So that might just be like a a gameplay thing. Attacking coastal settlements requires targets and enemies, of which there was no shortage. Green represents friendly land. Guess what red is? It's already turned seven, and the first AI has sailed into absolutely nowhere to try to Car attack us. But one of the big beater. positives we had being in the middle of nowhere is that for people to <laughs> sail to us, they take attrition okay. on the sea. Not like that stops the oh, nice. AI or these random ogres dying. Unsurprisingly, our first turns are mostly just upgrading our capital, hoard buildings, and resurrecting more units. As an undead faction, we do have necromancy, meaning we instantly resurrect units scaling based on how many have died in the area. More casualties equals more plentiful and powerful recruits. On turn 10, yeah, I decided to step one foot outside this kind of, of our challenge. base. Hello again. What a great idea. The armies we're fighting are either multiple 20 stacks Follows or a gash. homeless guy. By turn 15, Arkan got bored and left, so we sailed to a nearby Skull Island, able to auto-resolve a fight that really doesn't look like we should win, and still get a cool 20,000 gold. To make even more Ooh. money, we sailed over to Lustria near all the port settlements, because instead of occupying cities, we can establish pirate coves. These function as mini settlements, allowing us to siphon income from their owner. So despite only having oh, one settlement, I we see. can still scale our- uh, Yet another unique faction thing, kind of like the Skaven Undercity. Our economy to afford more units. Moving out to the northern cities, it's important to remember that being on land is an absolute nightmare. Case in point, that is a lot of naked green men. Now for reference, we have almost no melee units. We really just have uh, 1,601 guns. Something cool is that by upgrading our ship, we get cannon barrages as army abilities. Slightly better is the walking Colossus shooting his hand cannon like a SoundCloud rapper. The only issue is that it runs out of ammo quickly, but our gunnery whites can give uh, it more. Despite us having nothing oh, but cool. rusty guns and decomposing soldiers, apparently that's all we need. That and Noctilus eating several thousand damage and almost uh, dying. I don't think we had any business winning that. We did lose our depth guard, but gunnery mobs are both cheaper and comparatively better. With all the casualties taken, a necromancy site was created, so we could resurrect more units if we ever came back. But right now, our army was pretty solid with mostly gunners. So by now, we'd reach turn 22, mostly unharmed, despite the fact that over 100 factions have already died. Well, that sounds like a good thing. When the land gets conglomerated by the AI, the- Well, I guess with that many factions by turn 22, yeah. Yeah, people would just be gone. The only enemy they'll have left to attack is us. Like with this random Empire 20 stack, the first of many. From now on, Noctilus' new job is to run in circles and probably get shot, which when considering our levels of freedom output actually works pretty well. After each fight, we can use Invocation of Nahek to cheese extra healing, making sure Noctilus ends each battle with full health. To get some extra oh. gold, I can do a little diplomatic shenanigans by Very making good. fake peace treaties. It's like a business deal, except there is no business, there is no deal, and we threaten you with a gun. The funny part is, despite being at war with a lot of these factions, our relations are actually improving with them. For more money, what? we sailed to a few shipwrecks and recruited a vampire Ow. fleet captain. As fighting units, they're pretty useless, but on the campaign map, they can establish more pirate cities. Throwing one in Lothar, uh. our coves were beginning to look like femboys in Cambodia. A massive driver of GDP. Of course, the elves <laughs> don't really like being robbed, as is pretty evident. With Ulth one being so unfriendly, we found somewhere else a bit more welcoming. The peasant pits of Bretonia. And of course, within one turn of being being on land. Unfortunately for them, I have a bit of a surprise. A pretty small cannon called Queen Bess. The AI might be Whoa. good at dodging, but as soon as their archers stand still... Damn, dude. I mean, it's not as destructive as one of, like, Ikit Claw's nukes, but, uh... Uh, if that can fire several rounds in one battle. Our gunnery white can give it pretty much unlimited ammo. The rest of their army was as formidable nice. as their leader. They too walked directly into 6,000 bullets and died. Through the entire battle, Noctilus gained health? Now, winning against the Fey Enchantress awesome. is pretty important, because then we get her legendary defeat trait, plus 10% casualty replenishment. These traits exist oh. for each legendary lord in the game, with all of them being unique, and some of them cool. are enormously powerful, but scattered around the world. While there are a ton of these lords and traits, we mainly care about two, Sigvald and Marcus. Both have traits that improve Noctilus's army, and make him a living tank. So a side goal of our current campaign is to beat each of them in battle with his army. Getting back to the pirating, as Noctilus sailed around, our capital got attacked. While this army might look really, really scary, well, that's because it is. Defending the Maelstrom for the very first time. Ah, home sweet- Dude, this map looks pretty cool. 
Home. Something special among the Vampire Coast is aquatic units. Pretty much everything we have fights better in the water. Despite the enemy having heavily armored black orcs, our gunners do not really care, allowing us to win the battle with relatively few advantage. casualties. Still, our capital was mostly undefended, so I recruited our first army 30 turns into the game. To reinvigorate those zombie tax dollars, we could pay a little visit to Eltharion. Oh, never mind. There he is. One of his armies did walk into an ambush, letting us test our new cannons. By upgrading Noctilus's ship, we gain even more of those map-wide cannon shots. We'd also given Noctilus the ability to summon more units, which unsurprisingly also have guns. Ah, I love summoning gunners right in their face. Which is helpful considering <laughs> his ability to beat the crap out of people. Well, Noctilus winning is nice. Yeah, why am I not surprised that this is what my capital looks like? Well you did declare war on every faction in the game, so... It's to be expected. Altharion's army is better in every way. Defending on a hill gives our guns more leeway. Altharion led the mm. charge, foolishly believing I wouldn't shoot my own units. Our local pirate captain could also summon the pride of our fleet, giant undead crabs, circle beating Altharion to death. All right, Hell killing yeah. another elven 20 stack isn't bad. Go crabs. And another. And another two. I sure would love for Noctilus to come help if he wasn't running from wood elves in the ocean. The only positive is that we'd recruited a renowned admiral, allowing us to switch our second army's leader to one with his own horde and ship buildings. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to cheese this one using the help of the AI by turning off control what large is this? army. That means only 20 units can enter the battle at once, but by making this an AI controlled army, we get 40 and they only get 20. So even though their reinforcements are already here, they can't summon anyone else because they're at their 20 out of 20 cap. But for us, well, because ours is an AI controlled army, we just get everything. Despite our overwhelming oh. numbers, we are all- If it's a mechanic in the game, you might as well use it. I don't know if people would consider this like a cheese mechanic, but like, for a challenge like this, it's use what you can? So overwhelmingly incompetent, with extreme inefficiency because our army is quite literally falling apart. With the first army swarm, we barely pulled out a victory on the reinforcing second, resulting in a huge number of corpses. How many, you might ask? Uh... uh... I don't know. I never counted, you know. To clear the remaining armies, <laughs> Noctilus sailed back to the capital, taking out another 20 stack and earning a new mount. That house-sized Jumanji-looking ship we you have? Get yeah, to now ride he rides that? it. Oh, hey there, Tyrion. Couldn't see you down there. Tyrion's Bruh. legendary defeat trait was a nice bonus, adding army-wide melee attack. But what scared me a little bit more was Alariel the Radiant, or more aptly named, Alariel the Psychopath. Whenever I play Immortal Empires, there's three things that are always guaranteed. <laughs> Dies by turn five, Zinch is a master massive asshole, and Alariel the Radiant winds up whipping out the Sword of Cain and going on a genocidal rampage. Slay, girl boss. <laughs> the Sword of Cain is a unique melee weapon. Anyone sociopathic enough to claim it gets ungodly combat bonuses, yeah, yeah. army clearing vortex spells, and a general tendency to kill Reddy's everyone. Video. The longer a user has the Sword of Cain, the stronger it becomes. If we let Alariel use the sword uncontested, the problem is that she'll be too powerful to beat later. So our plan to stop her, the diplomatic approach. Invading Ulthwan. Mm. To get some war funding, we could channel our inner Jack Sparrow and navigate a series of treasure maps. You know, it's stuff like this that makes the game special. This level of thought and love, I really appreciate it. But not as much as I appreciate the dude who posted all the answers online. Not gonna lie, I do that too. <laughs> Sometimes you don't got the time to, to figure shit out, you know? A very limited amount of time per day, so just hop, skip, and jump to the answer. Yeah? Thank you very much to all of you people out there who, who make those guides. Approaching the Supreme Elven Donut, we were intercepted by the great Penny Cox. Luckily, Miss Cox was dispatched without losing a single unit, allowing us to breach the shores of Ulthwan. Sieging Vol's Anvil and Tor something, we took our first settlement to the game, speeding ahead by turn 51. Occupying pieces of the island, unsurprisingly, drew some unwanted attention. Alariel was only yeah, at yeah. war with one faction. Gee, who could that be? And with her upgrading Sword of Cain, it was time to spread those cheeks. Not to mention the other seven armies surrounding us. Luckily, in trying to kill one of them, a failed ambush, so we could lightning strike to fight only one enemy. I like that our army embraces those traditional values, recreating the atmosphere of the Waffle House. With the ambush foiled and another army obliterated, it was time. She had arrived. Bringing both of our best armies, Alariel sat at Dude, nearly 1,000 weapon strength, this is gonna be a massacre. speed, and the tankiness of a character from the hit game, Viva Pinya. 
Pinata. Don't hit me with your spade. We'd have to fight her now what before the sword game? of pain what? got any more powerful. Loading into the battle, we have two minutes to set up before she arrived, and with our 40 groups of gunners, I formulated a plan. Shoot her. In about three hits, she almost killed Noctilus, took out a few hundred infantry, and had Holy. learned to metal bend bullets into her skin. Oh great, it looks like their entire army routed. Not a L'Oreal. After more than 20,000 bullets, she finally went down, taking- Oh my god. She took down 350 people on her own. Sword of Cain is OP and busted. I think Grim Cleaper also mentioned that the longer you have the Sword of Cain, the stronger you become. So I feel like that's just a, a priority to obtain. But then again, once you get it, like every other faction declares war on you, no? I think that was the case, but I could be wrong. 350 people with her and nearly killing all our heroes. But her tyrannical rule could come to an end, letting us free the Sword of Cain for the sake of peace, global happiness, and mostly greed. I wouldn't say freed, more like under new management. So how does power beyond comprehension feel? Okay, I will keep that in mind. Pretty Higher good. combat stats, a tornado in a jar, and now everybody in the world hates us slightly more than a warm pillow. As Noctilus holds Makes the sword sense. for longer, the buffs get better and the debuffs get worse. The generic problem mm. with wielding the sword is that it'll eventually make everybody declare war on you. But for us, that's not a problem. It's a feature. With a large Yeah, right. I feel like you would just be jumping in joy if that was your goal. <laughs> to make everybody your enemy anyways, right? It's just automation at that point. Ariel wounded, it was a huge weight off our chest. Of course, that's like moving a boulder off a mountain. She may be gone, but they certainly aren't. The stage one sort of cane is fine. Running Noctilus into the enemy army alone is not the best idea. Yet. It's also important to remember that these gunners are tier 1 units, fighting much stronger armies. To really get Noctilus' army into late game shape, it would need an upgrade. And infantry, don't cut it. But that Necrofex Colossus we have, now that's not mm. terrible. Because the upgrade isn't cheap and the high elf capital just happens to be nearby, I necromanced a- is that a word? Necromanced? No, it is. I necromanced a oh, completely nice. new force, and with all the battle sites around, pulling an entire army out of my ass is surprisingly lubeless. With four armies to the north, it was clear we couldn't hold on to our settlements for long. Surrounding Val's Anvil were Lizardmen, Dark Elves, and a forgettable little faction, willingly taking attrition and led by a man named Melwyn. But the only thing blocking Lothurn was King Lewin and this random gaggle of elves. There's something so satisfying about watching a giant undead ship just blow away entire armies. I mean, I didn't even notice they had a sun dragon. It just died anyways. <laughs> wow, no. nice fire. Bringing ah. two armies to the gates of Lothar, and we fought a grand siege using auto resolve and then stole 25,000 oh, yeah. gold. Now all we have- You'd... I'm gonna assume the siege battles don't get too much better. <laughs> I watched Mandalore's video on Total War Warhammer 2, and uh, the siege battles did not look very good. To do is Alariel, round two, Kung Fu. Panda is a very good movie. Alariel may have better units, but we yeah. have the sheer unwashed True. masses of sheer unwashed masses. Well, this is three armies against <laughs> one. All our units are extremely injured and Alariel's army wasn't the only one nearby. The plan was basically abuse Wind of Death, our army cannons, and use Noctilus as a meat shield. For the rest of the campaign, we're going to be seeing a lot of this spell. Escaping into the ocean, it was clear we need to Use abandon our can. settlements at Gucci Island and regroup back at the capital to spend that elven gold on a really, really big boat. And the ability to recruit more Necrofex Colossi. Now, normally Hell these Colossi yeah. are absurdly expensive with almost 500 upkeep per turn, so a whole army of them would probably collapse our fragile economy. But as a savvy American, Noctilus has mastered the age-old art form known as minimum wage, granting a 20% <laughs> reduction in upkeep. When we combine that with another 20% oh, no. for level 5 horde, minus 23 from skills, minus 15, minus 10, and reality? minus 8, we get a game. grand total of 96% upkeep Warhammer reduction, fantasy, meaning it's more expensive to upkeep this it. than this. So while we're recruiting, let's take a step back and look at the world so far. Right now, Ulthwan is pretty much owned by Tyrion and Alariel, but what about everyone else? To the northwest, we have Malekith and Marathi, the Dark Elves, weirdly losing against the exiled Tomb Kings and beatbox champion Kata. <laughs> Beneath that, in Lustrio, is Marcus Wolfhart fighting the Lizardmen. As for the rest of the world, it is a mess, with the Dwarves somehow being the least atrocious looking faction. As more factions consolidate land, they'll be at war with less people, and eventually just us. Meaning we're on the clock until another 30 Doomstacks show up at our front door. And the best way Jesus. to handle a doomstack is a bigger doomstack. Something like, uh, hypothetically, 20, 20? Necrofex Colossi, yes. Noctilus, and yes. the Void, partaking in tomfoolery. As you might imagine, this army is pretty Dude. close to unbeatable, which is great considering the neighbors have arrived. Seeing that cresting over the hill, 
<laughs> Only thing I can think of is run. Well, like, what can you do against that, realistically? Discover new wildlife, and I shall name it Whoa. To test our army, we had to be careful, Lee Stupid. With Lightning Strike, Noctilus can single out any army. Surprise, surprise, we took no damage. So this looks like a perfect spot to end our turn. Time to mentally prepare myself to fight 16 battles. Lightning Strike is incredibly useful, especially for these scenarios, because from my understanding of it, it's basically like there are other armies surrounding you. If they're nearby, they can come in as reinforcements to interfere with your battle and like side with whoever they want. But if you have Lightning Strike, it just forces a one on one. I don't know if it's like a unlimited time thing, like, oh, it's, this gives you more time to attack your enemies, or maybe it gives you a more advanced position when you're fighting them. Never mind, because not a single AI attack, choosing life over- Halt, Noctilus! I see. They all just I ran. I tried to provoke the Good AI again, but just like before, they were gone faster than you could say, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> At no point in the campaign did I think this would be an issue. So as to fight someone, I went ahead with Noctilus's quest battle, an artillery duel with the Empire. Okay, my turn. For a bunch of giant legged <laughs> creatures, we're not very fast. We just slow walk towards our enemies and they're already Menacing. Dead. Moving past yeah. the quest battle, we caught King Lewin, and just like before, Same even thing. with the unbreakable Green Knight on their side, it only takes about six tons of raw cannonball to make him surprisingly flexible. Afterwards, I also took Noctilus off his Necrofex mount. While that might seem counterintuitive, he's actually a lot better on foot, becoming almost immune oh, really? to range damage and now extremely hard to kill. Plus, he clumps up enemies around him, which is helpful for other reasons. No matter the army we fight, uh, the plan yeah, is yeah, pretty true. much always Noctilus goes straight it's kind of like the Gorok and Lord Croak strat, right? Use a single unit to, to clump everybody up around them, and then since your cannons do AoE, it's just... It's perfect. Although I guess Lord Croak is probably a little bit better since his magic doesn't do damage to Gorok at all. But I'm assuming that, like, our dude here probably regens faster than the amount of damage they can output. Great, everybody else indiscriminately annihilate. And to give you an idea of how ruined the auto resolve is now, the game thinks this fight is a crushing defeat, which is oh, wrong, well, we'll but show uh, you. for who? So I think I've made yeah. my case that this <laughs> army is quite good, which means we can revisit some old friends. It's time to invade Ulthwan again. Again. Manifest Destiny. To begin our crusade of world conquest, our first mission was to completely occupy Ulthwan. As a giant island in the sea, it's both easy to defend and gets avoided by most of the endgame crises. Taking our very first steps onto land... Okay, see, now this is a crouching defeat. A 1v3 coupled with injured units, a scary enemy Jesus. lord, and being outnumbered 179 to 1. Well, we are Bro. not favored in this fight whatsoever. Okay, Tyrion, I hope you know what you bargained for. While Tyrion sat there and just got shot, we sent I... Noctilus in completely alone. Not very Interesting. fair for them. One hit with our big stick diplomacy, and their HP is gone. Great as it might seem like it's going, it wasn't very long until all our necrofects were fighting in melee. Like, where they kind of suck. Yeah, the only it's positive not good. is that they drop zombie okay. summons to protect them at half health. But Tyrion is a little too good at fighting them for it to matter. All right, we're down to pretty much just three Necrofex, Ooh, Colossus, yeah, that's not good. Noctilus, and a We've whole lost a lot. lot of summons. All right, oh. make that two Colossus. Just when I thought it was over, Noctilus barely killed Tyrion through the crowd. Surrounded oh. by hundreds of elves, he was quite literally too angry to die. We summoned more nice. zombies and used our sword's vortex over and over. After 10 minutes of grinding in a mosh pit of scrawny elves, the balance of power went back in our favor. At the low oh cost of our entire 30,000 gold army, we pulled out a win with Noctilus killing 800 people <laughs> on his own. <laughs> through the sheer oh man. This game is funny, but I suppose the power scale kind of tipped whenever their leader died because that should be like a, a really crushing defeat to their morale, yeah. Your will of one banana chinned man with a sharp stick, the campaign could continue. That By winning, we also chin. triggered yeah, our undead passive, resurrecting a few of our colossi, and since we oh, defeated nice. every defending army at once, that left their settlements open. Marching up to Vol's Anvil, Noctilus would face his toughest opponent yet, Door. The door. <laughs> what? 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 CJ what is this? On his own. What is this yeah, scene? Right. Oh Just by claiming God. our first settlement on Ulthwan again, uh. that didn't exactly resolve everything. Welcome to the capital. 
it sucks here. I have spent far too many hours fighting on this exact map. All the while, our population was suck. getting war weary. Don't worry, guys. Just a few more turns. Alariel was also back and sizing us up, forcing me to use my new special unit, the Gallows Giant. It's like a normal Colossus, but with some minor modifications. Back Flame in the thrower. capital, we fought off these surrounding fleets, earning us the first verse of a lost sea shanty. Random fleets around the ocean have these, and getting them gives us an army-wide ability to shoot even faster. The only thing I hear oh. in pretty much all these battles is just constant firing of cannons, because that is our ranged attack and our melee attack. With all our expansion, I recruited a fourth lord. See how we're making money right now? Well, say goodbye to our positive income, because from this point forward, the name of the game is Deficit Spending. On our way to Lothurn, we got intercepted by four whole armies. It was not a very hard fight. We're basically at the point where Noctilus's army beats everything so long as it's attacking, because we can lightning strike to lock out reinforcements. At the end of each battle, mm. we get to use the lore of okay, vampire's magic to gotcha. heal back, so we can effectively fight unlimited armies every turn. But the one thing that can make Noctilus even stronger, a better sort of cane. We can either choose to throw it away, sparing the world of its destruction, this or keep it, causing faction-wide upkeep increases, public order uh, loss, and Noctilus well, going that. completely insane. However, bigger sword, putting us at a whopping 1.1k weapon strength. So when arriving to siege Lothurn, we sent Noctilus in alone yet again. Ah, uh, my old nemesis. Here we go. Uh. Breaking into the city, there's a little unique trick we can use. Our main vortex spell, Wind of Death, is actually a ping pong ball. Within cities, we can bounce it off buildings to hit the same oh. enemy multiple times. The result is oh a my. seven little 801 kills and the great sack of Lothar. 20,000 gold and a whole lot of anti-humanitarian crime. Or at least it would be if I thought elves were people. Our empire now encompassed a small section of Ulthwan, afforded by Noctilus's army, leaving every battle having healed instead of taking damage. Our limit was more so every other army, having to to defend what Noctilus conquered from an elf whose greatest weakness was a school zone. More important than the land, though, was finding Marcus Wolfheart. As I said a while oh, no. ago, the two legendary lords thing? we wanted to fight were Sigvald and Marcus, with one of them in front of us right now. The Lizardman army was more than ready to do nothing, while Marcus came in as reinforcements. It's the yeah, flight of the strange. eagles, except the eagles are going up against 18 anti-aircraft guns. It didn't take long for Noctilus to find Marcus and win in two hits, gaining us his legendary defeat trait, increased range damage for every Everyone. Our next target would be Sigvald because his trait will make Noctilus unkillable. But because he lives deep in the Chaos Waste, we'd have to wait until we could reach him. In the meantime, our armies expanded, recruiting famous admirals like William Booty Catcher and our current Hell second yeah. mate, Burke Black, who was busy taking the gates protecting our old man. one. We'd also researched a special banner, which gives 20% ward save or damage reduction. Combining that with the Sword of Cain's 35% ward save and a random amulet's 8%, Noctilus was rocking a solid 63% damage reduction, which effectively more than doubles his health. With all the new land we'd gained, we yeah, could afford new much. armies and keep conquering Ulthwan, so long as foreign powers didn't intervene. But at turn so 87, and we it's not like anyone had too, a reason so to like... mess with us. Just end each battle with more health. You know, I figured, you know, maybe they're pretty close, like near my capital or something. No. They are not. Halting our faction burned the entire turn, getting several cities sacked and sending us back a little. But not every demon is a complete mm. douche. Because directly to the north of us... With I, I guess Zeech can kind of like just screw with you on random. Totally RNG. Makes sense for Zeech being the chaos god that he is. Bellacor. In a campaign where we are at war with everyone, Bellacor is probably the closest thing we have to an ally. I ignore him, he ignores me, and we both burn down Ulthwan. He even graciously let me take a free gate, and before I could repay the favor, conveniently disappeared. But in taking the gate, it revealed a new friend, Malakath, internet edgelord and incestual enthusiast. Back in the main part of Ulthwan, we began sieging the last resistance inside the island. After fighting three consecutive lightning strike battles, Tyrion City was exposed, which we conquered using the ancient art of waiting for them to starve. Elsewhere, Burke Black took another from Alariel, Orion hey, rammed his head into a garrison, and we got a quest for the final verse of our sea shanty with some of the best bonuses I have ever seen. But even with the shanty that doubles our fire rate, most of our armies weren't very strong. Zombie gunners and pole arms are objectively terrible units, even if they are cost efficient. Mm. And we couldn't just auto yeah, win with Noctilus because his army can't Not be everywhere. Good. Although we did get a special ancillary for a ship's carpenter, minus 50% horde building costs for oh, a single nice. army. Except you can move ancillaries around instantly at any time to any lord. Yeah. So after several turns of upgrading, Burke Black is dead. And in his place rises a new admiral, Man with Crabs. Because Necrofex Colossi aren't the only endgame unit. At the same <gasps> tier. Oh, yeah! Oh, 
I remember seeing these things. I'm just waiting for it. Is there gonna be a Ligma meme? <laughs> There's going to be a Ligma meme, isn't there? Leviathan. Then after recruiting a few, my income was hit by a red lobster delivery truck. But it did allow us to bully a L'Oreal, and any amount of money is worth that. Plus, this is only four crabs. It only gets worse from here. Bringing a L'Oreal down to her last settlement, we were also able to obtain our final shantyverse, doubling reload speed, giving mass leadership, and plus 15 public order map-wide. So instead of enacting nice. governmental change, we're just singing sea shanties. Congress, Makes take sense. notes. On Octolus' side of the island, he demolished about 420 stacks in a single turn, chopped down Durthu, and wrestled control over most of Ulthwan, even eradicating Alariel's faction. Despite mostly dealing with the High Elves, we now had to deal with these slightly more sober Elves. Noctilus was busy sieging one of the major slightly High Elf settlements, blocking elves. the rest of their land, although apparently shooting <laughs> cannons at walls is surprisingly precise. For whatever reason, they keep sending out one unit at a time to duel Noctilus. Eventually, after wiping out most of their single entities, I, I got Right now is pretty much the grindy part, fighting unlosable lightning strike battles and reclaiming settlements. So I'll skip ahead to turn 110. In just a few Jesus. short turns, we have grown. I am extremely curious, how long does it take Cleeper to actually finish one of these videos? Because, yeah, each of these turns and managing everything and also being at war with every other faction must be insane. And, like, the siege battles themselves also take a very long time, so... Yeah, just hats off to him. If you haven't already, please, I, I encourage you to go down into the description, very top link to the video. Give him a like, give him a sub, because uh, this is great stuff. But not alone. The old world is almost completely ruled by dwarves, Empire, and Cathay, which would be fine if they weren't all allies. Empire ships oh, were already showing up at Ulthwan, and Malekith was ready to get goofier than a moist critical police Ooh. chase. A silver lining was that the High Elves <laughs> are dead. With I remember watching that. <laughs> uh, there's just something about Charlie. Goofy man. <laughs> One last fight against Lothar and we'd removed all High Elves from Ulthwan. But other enemy armies were pretty much everywhere, requiring me to sail out and fight several dwarf armies per turn. In summary, things are bad. Our armies had also hit the campaign movement limit. Because we have so many movement bonuses, there's no difference between march stance and default stance. So apparently oh. these peg legs run off rocket fuel. On the oh... There's a campaign movement limit. Okay. I guess they have to introduce these limits so that the game doesn't get way, way crazy, right? Because, like, there's also the, the regen limit, I think. I, I forget exactly what it's called, but basically, basically, you can only regenerate a certain amount of health per battle. So you can't just, like, stick there infinitely. Like, uh, old, what was it? League of Legends <laughs> tanks. Thank goodness they, they kind of changed that system, but yeah. The less horrible side, we were forcing Chaos and Bellicor from the island. Our income was not negative, and Crabman had yeah, acquired that's, more crabs. That's they may be heavily armed, but we are heavily legged. I guess you could say we beat the crab out of them. Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention, the crabs are auto-resolved gods. I don't even need to fight this to destroy both armies. Meanwhile, oh, Noctilus' nice. army has the weakest auto-resolve I have ever Save seen. Oh, a small Bretonian garrison. Crushing defeat. Forcing me to manually fight almost every battle with his army. But winning this one meant we could make landfall in the old world with our very first settlement. By being in the old world, Noctilus could draw aggro from most armies, allowing us to freely boot every other faction off Ulthwan and essentially secure the whole island. Advancing further and taking Castle Bastone, we'd cleared out most of the resistance from Bretonia. Three whole empire armies. If only there were a button that let me beat all of them in the same turn. <laughs> Army one, meet the deadly Lubinarch of Hish. In only a few shots, it can take down a Necrofex easily, which is exactly why I decided meleeing Noctilus was somehow smart. Look at this disgusting empire smut. Not really? in my Christian server. Moving on to- That thing can take down a Necrofex that easily? Well, I mean, we do have freaking giant ships on legs, so I suppose every other faction has to have their like super OP unit too. Army two, we were faced with the immovable steam tank. Army 3, Carl Franz. Carl looks like he is oh, not the man slept himself. in at least a week. Starting the battle, I figured it would be pretty easy. Noctilus walks over, beats down Franz, and we get to important stuff, like paying off our debt. But much like my student loans, Carl Franz is so crushingly strong. Oh my god, Carl really? is uh, over 1k- What? 1k weapon strength? What does he have? 
Okay, weapon strength, 85. Wait, he's got better stats than Noctilus. Jesus, that really? might not seem like a lot of damage, but with Noctilus's 80% physical resistance, that means Carl did something like 8,000 damage in about 10 seconds. Luckily, his decision Whoa. to fly away was tactically poor wow. by Carl. <laughs> <laughs> no, Carl Franks, no. Oh, man. <laughs> I still got to learn more about this, man. But damn, like, we had the Sword of Cain for so long. I don't know how many, like, times it has buffed us by this point, but, like... Yeah, that's, that's impressive. It didn't take long after that to expand in the old world, lining the entire ocean in some sort of vampire coast. But our struggle wasn't over quite yet, because panning to the west, <laughs> hello Marathi, bringing three armies plus a garrison to the front, losing this fight meant losing the whole western side of the island. Now there is no actual way we fairly win this. Marathi's armies are absolutely juiced with dragons, medusa, and hydras. So we have to do Damn. the next best thing. I'm gonna cheat. Using the AI-controlled army trick, we could have all 80 of our units fighting 20 of theirs at a time. All right, and uh, all the right. tables have turned ever so slightly, as you can the see turns the number go up. What in the heck? One, it didn't take long for the entire battlefield to be swarmed by Walmart-tier undead, who were literally born yesterday. I really wish I could describe in better detail what was actually happening, but all I know is we've already lost a thousand units, and the- <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, I see. So uh, the AI controls it. They're probably not going to do the best moves, but you can kind of use swarm tactics to cheese out these kind of battles. You will lose a lot of people, though, because they're not exactly good units or well controlled in any way. Although I am very curious as to how my computer would fare against this. I feel like... <laughs> Our streams would just become PowerPoint presentations. Just imagining it trying to, like, render all of these troops in battle. Yeah, no, that's not gonna work out. Battle's not been going on for very long. Jesus Christ, their lord is still alive and she has 405 kills. Not to mention Marathi <laughs> landed once and she has been stuck here for the entire game. With the first enemy reinforcements <laughs> coming in, we still had to fight two whole other armies. But our saving oh, grace was a damn. spell called Van Geist's Revenge, summoning the Flying Dutchman to obliterate Ooh. their best units. That one shot alone netted 400 kills. You know things are bad damn. when you outnumber them 1,700 to 14 and you're losing. With the last few enemies being blood rack medusas, we managed to pull them down with our ROR crabs. At the cool cost Lost of 6,500 lives, yeah. we managed to push back Marathi in the Dark Elves. While the south was distracted, we sent the great crab what man across the pond, flattening four Dark Elf armies at once, and about a turn later, sieged our first Dark Elf city. What's the point of building giant walls if you are next to a giant hill? Collapsing the settlement earned us a holding in Nagaroth, where we could start to take over the Dark Elves. Plus, our Good other point. three armies sailed across to gain another Another port from Marathi. Looking back towards the old world, we will ignore the old world. Our economy was allowing us to field eight We're armies at once, you. despite losing 4,700 in supply lines alone. The crab stack sat on Malekith, took even more settlements, and greeted our new enemy, the Tomb Kings. Well, Katep, I can't blame you for trying. But he can. With a foothold in Nagarond and a handle on the old world, the tendrils of Noctilus's patriotism had spread across the globe. We'd even achieved our long campaign victory, so oh, really, nice. what was left to stop us? Okay, that's uh, pretty bad. A dwarven endgame crisis, with the dwarves being uh -oh. the most powerful faction. Now, I know that doesn't yeah. seem ideal, but I have good news. They are not alone. Apparently, I forgot to change my settings at the start, so every crisis oh. begins on a long campaign victory. So now we have 10 oh. turns to prepare. Did I say 10? No, no, no. I meant one. Bringing one. back as many yeah. armies as possible and completely abandoning the old world, it was time to watch the Supreme Battle Royale unfold. And if you thought the map looked disgusting oh, now, Jesus. dwarves, 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 tube kings, Everywhere dwarves. dwarves. Plus all those other factions that will probably die to dwarves. Although strangely, the only armies I couldn't find were the Skaven ones, part of the Vermintide Crisis. Even more so when I realized all the Skaven factions were back, but none of them were actually on the map. In terms of the other Crisis armies, okay. we're lucky because Ulthwan spawns none of them. Our main issue is Mausillion and a Heinrich Kemmler who hit the gym. Plus, in the top left of the map is Grombrindle's faction and a Wood Elf city. While there are other armies like Grimgore, Manfred, and Orion, we get to roleplay High Elves and not care. Sorry, Seth you're on your own. Passing the turn just once, 
I am now scared. With Mausillion coming across the channel, we evacuated Noctilus to defend Ulthwan. Unsurprisingly, the rest of the world had evolved backwards. There's the Kislev Chaos Ways, Kugat's Island Paradise, Dwarven Slovenia, Kairos, JP Morgan Fate Weaver, and the Clan Angren, <laughs> Oak of Ages. And that's not all. Kotap's Mountain Disco, Dark Elf Grombrindle, the Skaven Navy, a Twilight Fan Club, Mean Girl Kemler, Pacifism for the Peace God, the Undead Pirate Forest, Jurassic Park 2, and Archaeon, still alive and wishing he was dead. But in the midst Somehow. of the chaos, one thing stood out. Sigval, who decided to show his face in Northern Nagaron. Sending Noctilus to catch him, we were oh. intercepted by oh. a Ooh. where we gained his legendary defeat trait and moved on. Sure enough, nice. Sigvald was still round, so we could Yo, finally we to go for this guy. allowing us to get his legendary defeat trait, which isn't showing up. But it's probably just hidden in the menu after... Bellacor? Little known fact, there's actually a cap on the number of traits you can have. Right now, we have 30, oh, and the no. cap is 30. Sigvald's trait would have put Noctilus to essentially 90% ward save, multiplying effective health by 1000%. And for reference, oh going back to that God. high battle where Noctilus killed everything alone, if we took all the damage he did to every unit combined, then inflicted it on him, he still would not die. Which would have happened if not for Bellacor. I would God. be back. But Damn right now, it, dude. there was something slightly more pressing. A nuclear bomb under my city. Well, Ickit had made it to Ulthwan oh, and infested oh, it with the God Under Damn Empire. It, Naturally, his first inclination was domestic terrorism. Clearing the Under City isn't difficult, but there's no way of knowing how many others there were spread around the world. So I went about putting detection in every settlement. Right now, though, our biggest threat was Grombrindle and the Northern Dwarves, because leaving Noctilus out on his own... For as invincible as Noctilus is, the rest of our army is less so, and losing yeah. Necrofex is fairly expensive. To that end, I spent the next half hour kiting while Noctilus killed their entire army. After 40 minutes and several dead Necrofex, we beat the dwarves, and immediately only. afterward, <laughs> the Skaven Crisis. Plotting the underneath the earth, they'd finally arisen to take over a swamp, a desert, this dwarf's ass, in the middle of literally nowhere. Now, as much as I want to conquer <laughs> the entire world and paint it hot pink, we've run into a bit of an issue. Lag. There's something like 500 armies on the map right now, and each turn takes a decade to pass. Call it laziness, call it decadence, but instead of fighting through every single province and forgetting what grass looks like, I have a better idea. Ah, One last fight. We yeah. I don't blame you for this one, man. Invincible, our land expansive, and of all the enemies we could go after, there was clearly one that stood flames. out. So to make it fair, I disbanded this. every Necrofex we had and sailed Noctilus to our destination. Hello, Bellacor. One God man army. This god. <laughs> oh, this is so good. I still wish this music was actually in the game. Wait, is it in Warhammer 3? I, I wish they, they put it into 3, because I saw in Mandalore's video for 2. Thanks to wasn't. all of you, I've made the decision to go full time. Now I can finally become oh, the nice. content creator I've always wanted to be. Playing games like Dota 2, Minecraft, <sighs> and the sickest reactions you've ever seen. So Noctilus, do you have anything <laughs> left to say? Also, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring the video. You can check out the game using the link in the description or the pinned comment below. Seeing that campaign unfold before my eyes was incredible. And the fact that we survived declaring war on every single faction in the game is just insane to me. I guess it really goes to show that like, if you know like, what you're doing and which combinations are busted, you can pretty much win any campaign.